get started in a second. Want to introduce Mr. Stu? Mr. Stu. All right, buddy, we got another presentation on digital marketing. We got Stuart Blessman, Director of Digital Marketing at Punchmark. He's going to be talking about trends and opportunities. Hope you guys enjoy. Give him a quick round of applause. <laughs> hey. Whoever said hi, hi. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, good to see a bunch of friendly faces here. A couple of people texting me at midnight saying, why am I not at the bar? But you know, it's kind of how it goes. So we're gonna dive in a little bit today, talking about some digital marketing trends and opportunities and specifically how it can map to the marketing funnel and what you're trying to do to generate store traffic, website traffic, and ultimately online sales. Is my screen being shared? No, 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 share your screen like that. On Zoom? Yeah, yeah. Start, guys. Where's the Zoom? Um, All right. Building off of what Hope just presented on, Google Merchant Center and shopping ads, Facebook shop, et cetera. They're all just a part of a larger marketing funnel and evolving trends that shoppers are going through when they're shopping and buying jewelry online. So you might've listened to a recent episode of In The Loop where we talk about the marketing funnel. It's a pretty standard kind of funnel that a lot of people use in a lot of different industries. We specifically based our conversation around one provided by SEM Rush. It's what a digital marketing tool out there useful for PPC, SEO, a bunch of different things. But the way they've broken down the marketing funnel is most clients, in fact, pretty much all clients, customers, go through at the top the awareness. They need to know who your store is, that you exist. Then they go into consideration. What is unique about you? What is different? Do you have the product they're looking for? Pricing, et cetera. Then they go into conversion, basically purchase. Why should I choose you? What's unique about you? Is there kind of like free extra perks, et cetera, free shipping, et cetera? Finally, at the bottom comes down to loyalty. What are you doing to retain them as a customer? How are you bringing them back? We'll be talking about the main three there, loyalty. There's a lot of different things you can do with that. So mapping the customer journey towards um, a jewelry store, you start with awareness at the top. So that is typically your broadest audience. You wanna get in front of as many people as possible and let them know you exist. So ways that people have done that in the past have been, let's run a lot of television commercials, newspaper ads, billboards, et cetera. Nowadays, that typically translates more toward YouTube, display advertising, video campaigns, and other platforms. Anything that has the largest reach for the lowest cost per impression, you're trying to get in front of as many eyeballs as possible but the end result being you won't necessarily get as many clicks. You're literally just trying to reach a large audience. Next stage would be consideration. Smaller audience, these are people who are actively looking for jewelry, not necessarily just looking for a store, but they're actually looking. I wanna buy something for my spouse. I wanna buy a gift for somebody. Old school, that could have been more newspaper ads. It could have been an email marketing campaign. Could have been a very specific mailer you send out. Nowadays, a lot of people will do it through like a shopping ad, a social ad, maybe Google business profile if you have some kind of like events and specials being posted there, or through Google organic. Somebody's just searching regularly and they want to know, hey, what do you carry? What product's going to show up in the SERPs for you? Next stage down, conversion. Again, that could be the, basically the buying audience. You can reach them through search ads, email, SMS, shopping ads, social ads. There's a lot of these kind of tactics and techniques that can fit multiple stages, but the end goal being these are people who are probably the most expensive to reach out to because they're the people who are ready with their credit card to make a purchase. When it comes to Google, and most of my presentation will be focused on Google, Facebook, you can kind of map most of this to it as well, but it's a little bit different. Google has an option for basically every step of the buyer's journey. So whenever somebody goes on Google, they might be looking for you on search first, they might be looking for maps, or if you're trying to reach a larger audience, they might see one of your YouTube ad campaigns first, just like they would have seen a television commercial that you have an event coming up or a special or sale. 
So let's break down some of the opportunities and trends within each of the different stages of the funnel. So focusing on awareness first, how do you make more shoppers aware your jewelry store exists? So one of the common things I hear whenever I'm doing like a sales call, talking to people at the trade shows, et cetera, is the common thing that happens of we've been driving by you for many, many years. We did not know you exist. A lot of jewelry stores, either through positioning, location, or just kind of offering slash marketing you've done in the past, they don't know you actually exist. They're only aware of, you know, whoever's anchored at the mall, whoever's, you know, close by to something that they go to regularly. So they might pass by 10 jewelry stores without even knowing you're one of their options, and yet you could serve them the best. The awareness stage of the customer journey is focused on what can we do to make them aware of you to eventually come to you to purchase. Ultimately, though, customers are searching differently than they have over the last few years, over the last 10, 20 years. Um, one example, I was talking to a friend of mine recently, and she was looking to get her nails done. She did not open Google to find you know, a no local nail salon. She literally opened Instagram, started looking through hashtags, looking for people who are local to her, and could see the style as well as the contact information and booked her appointment directly through Instagram, did not touch Google once. The how customers are looking for jewelry is changing, especially with the younger demographics. So first and foremost, um, we mentioned before Google Merchant Center, take advantage of as many kind of organic opportunities you have to push your products and your store out there. So step one, if you have a Punchmark website or if you're on another platform that has a jewelry specific feed, make certain you're taking advantage of pushing all your products out of your website and into the marketplaces most people are shopping to reach the broadest number of people possible. So as an example, I just pulled a month's worth of traffic from one of our clients who was using Google Merchant Center, just the free side of things. They're getting an additional 26,000 views on their jewelry in their local market. In this case, statewide, but they are located near a major city. So they have some opportunities there. Take advantage of your Google business profile. It used to be called Google My Business. Whenever you set that up, you wanna make certain that it has all the appropriate NAP information, name, address, phone number that is relevant to the city and specifically the suburb of the city that you're located in. So if you're located right outside of a major hub, like a New York City or like Minneapolis or someplace like that, you wanna niche it down a little bit more toward the suburb and not just get swallowed up by the larger demographic pool nearby. Whenever you're seeing a near me search happen, that typically comes down to Google using proximity of the person and their phone to the store itself. There's not really too many ways to kind of hack that. Whenever you go and somebody searches for that, Google will try to put the best, most relevant and nearest store to them not necessarily the best overall, so to speak, the biggest, et cetera. One little hack you can do on things like Google Business Profile is when you add in your name of the store, do a little hyphen and do the location, especially if you have multiple locations. Doesn't really help too much from an organic standpoint, but it allows customers nearby to say, oh, you're in a suburb, you're in a part of the city that I frequently shop at, I wanna send more traffic to them and get them to come to you more often. Any questions about uh, these topics right here, Google Merchant Center or Google Business Profile? Yes. Yeah, so Google is essentially sunsetting the independent login and profile you can use for things. They're trying to incorporate it directly into Google search. So when you're logged in with the appropriate accounts, you go into Google, you type in your business name, they want you to manage all the information right there as opposed to going to a separate program. Not the best of decisions on their part. I don't know how that's going to play out. Yep, it's kind of a pain. Google's always changing things. Reaching a broad audience through display and social campaigns has been very effective, but they typically are very high impression, low clicks. 
So whenever we bring on new marketing clients at Punchmark, one of the things I've noticed right away in their accounts is they have a large number of display visitors coming to them, but few people actually purchase and few people actually click from the display campaigns. So if you've ever been like walking around the internet, so to speak, seeing, you know, foxnews.com, CNN, you go to eBay, you go to all these different websites, you might see an ad following you around for like, you know, overnight or stellar or something like that. Those are typically display campaigns and they were built just to get an image in front of people, but not to generate sales or clicks, so to speak. It's brand awareness, trying to get those five, 10, 15 impressions before somebody is actually ready to make a purchase. If you're looking to make a splash and just get your name out there, say we have an event coming up, we want to advertise our store or we offer certain services, this is an effective way of getting your name out there, but it won't lead to an immediate ROI. Social campaigns, they kind of work in the same way. One thing we do not recommend a lot of our marketing clients do is just clicking on boost a post. It's good for reaching, you know, your mom's friends, you know, your sister's friends and cousins, things like that, friends of friends, basically, but it's not a targeted audience. Targeted audience would be, I want to reach everybody in a certain radius, 24 to 35 years old, who are either recently got engaged or looking to purchase jewelry or in the future. That's an effective way of getting in front of a larger group and kind of raising awareness of the product or the event you have coming up, but it's much more targeted even though broadly, than just saying, hey, I want my cousins and nephews to see things, the people who already like your stuff because they're friends of your business. Questions here? They're typically set up through Google. So there's different options there for a display campaign in Google. You can basically say, I want to show on different interest groups, different types of websites. You can add in your audience as well. So we'll show it to people who've been like cookied and visited your website in the past. But ultimately it's looking for the largest potential audience because they just literally want to get eyeballs in front of it. Um, one side drawback of doing a display campaign, if you're not vigilant on it, is they will also display on YouTube at times or even free apps. Like if you downloaded a free app from the Google store and they'll put a little banner at the bottom, that's how they kind of basically monetize those free apps. And they're trying to encourage people to click that little free weather app download or like special happening. But the person who's actually seeing that, I wouldn't argue that they're in market, so to speak. They're not actually looking to purchase. Facebook is a little bit more of a walled garden, but you're basically taking the same approach of pushing to people's feeds regularly. Video campaigns. Honestly, video is the most effective way out there for the largest like splash in front of people. It tends to be the lowest cost per impression. I've been seeing like one to two cents of view on YouTube campaigns. And they keep on just coming out with new options. So one of the things I wanted to highlight on this channel or on this slide right here is these fast channels. How many people in this room have a Roku device or know a friend who has a Roku? Pretty much everybody. So when you download Roku, it comes with a bunch of free apps and there's other streaming apps you can download too as well. So things like Pluto TV, Peacock, Tubi, et cetera. Fast channels are basically the non-on-demand cable of streaming. So where I'm living here in Charlotte, I get targeted by a couple of different jewelry stores locally that every commercial break when I'm watching like, you know, soccer, or if I turn on, you know, the Star Trek Next Generation channel, whatever it might be, there'll be a regular commercial break, just like regular television and local businesses are advertising on there, HVAC, jewelry, et cetera. Cost-wise, it's basically a third of what cable pays, and yet they've been able to niche it down, and it's one of the fastest-growing segments out there because there's like 10 million people a year basically buying Roku televisions. I would say if you're somebody who's done a lot of cable television investment in the past and you're still doing it slash you have the old creative and assets, 
look into advertising on like internet movie database TV, Pluto TV, all these different fast channels that people are using and playing either in their stores or playing in their homes at night. Yes, you can. It's not as hyper specific as I only want to be six to 7 p.m. on three channels kind of things. But if you say I want to reach the men who are 20 to 45 who are interested in like sports, history, sitcoms, whatever, you can do that. And from what I've been able to see from other people who are running it, it's actually pretty dang effective. But again, it's a television kind of angle replacing what you might have done on cable in the past. All right, consideration, trends, and opportunities. How do you make more shoppers consider you above other jewelry stores? So I mentioned it before, like you wanna be found, you wanna be seen, but a lot of people kind of drive by you. There's little ways you can kind of get in front of them saying, hey, we got a special, we have a deal, we have you know free chocolates or roses. If you sign up right now, you'll buy something. There's the little hacks you can do to make you consider above other people. So Google Shopping before, um, Holt mentioned that we would recommend a $500 a month budget for Google or for Facebook in order to boost your product catalog in front of all the listings. It can be dang effective in getting in front of a lot of people. So quick example, this was literally a $400 budget spread out over 28 days, semi-major metro, metro, I'd say like, you know, kind of B market, not New York City kind of thing. They were able to get 300 million views on their jewelry, leading to close to 6,000 clicks. They saw e-commerce sales increase from that. Percentage-wise, somewhere between like 30, 40%, kind of hard to say. But they also told us that they had, you know, a ton of people come into their store from their local area to say, hey, I saw this on Google Ads. I want to come and purchase from the, this from you. Do you have it also available in this style, this color, et cetera? One of the challenges of doing Google Shopping for us is that we don't necessarily see the last mile on things. So if somebody comes into the store from a Google ad, we would rely on you to tell us, hey, what purchases were made? What questions did they ask? What kind of information can you provide? If it was purely an e-commerce transaction though, this is one of the more effective ways of getting people just to push e-commerce sales online. Basically it's boosting, so to speak. Any questions on this? Whenever you send somebody to a website, never, ever, ever, ever send them to the homepage. Don't ever do that, please. So that's the equivalent of what, what making somebody walk in the front door, but there's nobody there to greet them. We highly recommend setting up landing pages, especially curated landing pages for every major event, holiday, collection, category, et cetera. Gives you the opportunity, multiple fronts. You can highlight the different brands you carry, whether it's like a men's jewelry page and you're showing Inox and other people, or if you have like a Mother's Day thing coming up and you want a price anchor, here's $500 gifts, $100 gifts, $1,000 gifts. It helps with your SEO, especially if it's well-written and kind of built out. And it basically gives people the funnel of here's the different options of shopping as opposed to literally here's all the different products you could per potentially purchase. Guide them to the purchase they want or that you want them to make slash what are they looking for originally. Site manager in the edge. Briefly touch on SEO here. Let me go back though. I'm good. Yeah, go ahead. I attempted to do a collection to advertise experience with, and we didn't have our shop set up necessarily on Facebook, but I used product images and ran a brand ad. However, the URL, if I wanted to link to that exact ring, was too long for Facebook link to click into our page. I have never heard that before. <laughs> I have never run into a URL too long. <laughs> it, it can only, it's just little that they give you. Huh. Oh, is it the display URL, the destination URL? Oh, the destination. 
Destination would be the end result. So if you like, you know, jewelrystore.com slash jewelry details slash all the names of the product, that's fine. The display URL is what somebody would actually see on the ad, but it's not where they end up. So you can shorten that by saying like, you know, name.com slash pendants or specials. And that's a little hack. So they only limit you to around like 50 to 70 characters doing that. The destination itself can be as long as it needs to. Yeah. When it comes to uploading the images and things, if you're doing like one image to like one product page, try to link that as closely as possible. But if you're kind of doing like, I want to do a special on an entire category, maybe link to the category on the website or like a landing page to that, not just like the one product. Because then you'll get basically 80% of the hits there. People will start dropping off. You'll never see everybody looking at everything. Yep. If the like if you said if the page is long, it's like category pendant day and that could be for you know Mother's Day or Christmas or that, you know whatever. I don't remember. Right. Yeah. So so in, in those cases, if you want to run an ad to the local landing page, that's more important. The conversion of the landing page is the only thing that would really um, help with that process. Uh, another little thing, um, it's not in the presentation because Facebook just literally changed it like a week or so ago. They're they're rolling out the ability to add up to five links in your Instagram profile now, so you can dedicate one just to like the special and things. It used to be just the one link. People would use things like Linktree, but now they're making it so you can have up to five. Not certain when that goes live. It's just been announced, but hopefully soonish. All right, site managing the edge. Let's talk about SEO and Google for a second. Um, there's two. Three main things that help rank your website in Google, specifically ranking product pages in Google. The title tag or the product name, number one. So there's some restrictions there. You know, when you're on your phone, when you're in your desktop computer looking at a jewelry page in Google's results, they're only going to show about 70 characters for the product name. That 70 characters has to also ideally include your store name. So it gets very tight. The meta description, sometimes called the product description, something you, you can edit in the edge slash when it shows up here in Google where it says in stock, 18 karat, et cetera. The only, it's like the first 140, 160 characters will display in Google. The rest of it gets cut off, but still shows up on the actual product page and is there to inform, educate, eventually entice somebody to purchase that piece of jewelry online. The key difference between the title tag where it says gold crosses, Arezzo Jewelers, et cetera, and the meta description in stock 18 carat, the meta description does not help your website rank at all, period. It's literally sales copy, educational copy, it's informational, but the people who click on that, who are enticed to click on that, that does help your website rank. So it's this kind of like weird game Google has going on. In that first 70 characters, yeah. Doesn't help you rank at all. Meta title does. So this page in particular ranks for Gold Crosses, Arezzo Jewelers, Elmwood Park, Illinois. Combinations of different things, Google will mix and match. Those are the key phrases ultimately it's going for. Same as in the URL at the very top, it says slash jewelry slash religious the URL portions and the phrases and words in there do help your website rank. It's an indirect ranking, so to speak, in terms of the meta description. People who click on it help it rank, but it itself, the copy does nothing. Don't ignore it though, ultimately. So kind of an example, whenever the first 70 characters try to always put, you know, the name of the jewelry, name of the brand, most relevant color size, et cetera, when we upload products from the edge to our website, we have a formula behind the scenes that we've worked on that kind of like auto fills different things based on product title, name of the store, et cetera. It's good. It's not great. It's very engineering, technical driven, so to speak. 
It's not sales copy of like, please stop into the store to purchase this, multiple sellers, colors available, things like that that might actually entice somebody to make that final step. I know your issue, yeah. <laughs> um, is there a way to globally change the meta description that's auto-generated? Meta description. Oh, title. At some point, when you scale to a number of different stores, I would honestly recommend not including the store or the location in things like the meta description. Um, Google Merchant Center works off of basically having kind of like the one location that is the shipping hub for things. If you start trying to add, this is also available in three, four, or five different locations around the state, it gets a little bit more complicated and you're basically just adding a bunch of stuff here. It's available from you as a business, ultimately not so much in individual location. There's a lot of esoteric things I could get into with SEO. So if anybody has any questions about SEO, I'll just take them like one off. It's hard to cover nowadays. Conversion, why are we all here? We ultimately want people to purchase from us. So how do you convince shoppers to purchase their jewelry from you, whether online or in store? Different demographics are swayed by different things, whether it's the incentive, the expectation that Everybody always has free shipping because people grew up with Amazon. Um, not all shoppers are necessarily swayed by things like years in business, family owned, et cetera. Many people are just more like, what is the final price? What is the availability? Can I get it tomorrow? Crap, it's my anniversary kind of thing. We are seeing basically across all our websites that the number one way people purchase jewelry, whether it's in store or eventually want to do it online through e-commerce is through a chat client. So we primarily integrate with ClientBook and Podium. We've seen that ClientBook has become the number one sales tool for a lot of different jewelry stores, specifically those who enable their sales team, give them a phone, say, hey, I want you reaching out to people. I want you answering questions. An alternative way of doing it is using automations, using simple scripts, so that when people come in, they're automatically funneled, placed to a different um, person that needs to contact them, answer their questions, capture their information. You don't have to deal with the problem anymore of who's going to sit at the computer 24-7 answering the question. Highly, highly recommend everybody in the room start using SMS text messages as much as possible, whether you're doing it through the edge, client book, et cetera. Set up little automations, little ways of reaching in front of people, such as Hey, it's been a year since your purchase. How's things going? Would you like to book a free cleaning? Come on in. 30 days later, hey, we're asking for reviews, whatever that might be. There's a million different ways that you can set up an automation to reach out to people after they've made a purchase. Slash, from a marketing standpoint, automation and specifically SMS is one of the most effective ways of getting new products in front of people or letting them know there's an event coming up because people are guaranteed to read it basically double what they're doing on email nowadays. Any questions on chat or SMS email? Uh, Tends to typically be about five to 10%, but that kind of comes down to how aggressive are you being with the messages and are they aligned with the person who wants to receive them? I would never recommend taking your entire client list and dumping them in there without an opt-in. But if somebody says there's certain topics, certain things I'm interested in, like new products or show me only like, you know, the gold chains that are coming to your store, you're aligned with them. And as long as you're not bombarding them three times a day or something like that, perfectly happy. Mm. 
That's challenging. <laughs> Yep. Kind of going back to Amelia's question before about churn and unsubscription, things like that. Churn is actually a healthy thing when it comes to email lists or SMS lists, et cetera. So if you have people who haven't purchased from you five, six years ago, and they're still on your email list, it's actually detrimental to your business to maintain them in that list. There's a couple of different reasons for that. One, the more people you add, more likely you have to pay for things, unless it's literally a pay per send subscription you have to like MailChimp or Clavio or something like that. But there is such a thing as deliverability. And there have been studies shown that if you have a lot of dead weight on your account, a lot of suppressed people, people haven't opened in a long time, that does limit the deliverability because the platforms will view your account as 30% not good to 40% not good, et cetera. So when we've encouraged people to basically audit their list and say, hey, anybody who hasn't opened something in 24, year, 24 months or something, send like a dear John, hey, are you still interested? We'd love to keep you around. I get those all the time from different businesses myself. Once you do that, you'll get a couple of people back, maybe 10%, 15%. The rest of them, basically export them, keep them in a separate CSV file and get them out of your MailChimp, get them out of your client book, et cetera. You will notice that your deliverability rates and open rates will improve over time. And then in the future, you have that separate list. You can always, you know, clientele to them, reach out to them, however you want to get in touch with them to basically win them back. But don't just maintain them because they purchased from you at one point, maybe they will purchase again. That's like 102 level. Like most people don't have to deal with that stuff, but it's just, it, it comes up every once in a while. Local business reviews. So another massive study came out recently kind of analyzing what has happened in the last two or three years when it comes to local SEO, business reviews, kind of all those things. A lot of finite granular details on things, but there was a couple things that like stuck out to me that I wanted to highlight for you guys. Number one, literally Google doesn't care if you have a four or five star review. They lump them into a bucket called four to five. Now, obviously five is better than four, 4.9 is better than 4.1, et cetera. But in the eyes of Google, there is no difference in when it comes to like helping your business rank locally, showing up higher on Google Maps, things like that. It's all the same. People have done surveys. Literally 85% of people are willing to go to a three to four star place. Um, personally, I'd rather go to a 3.9 star restaurant than a 4.9 star because typically that means it's better for cooking, even if the service is not as good. Just kind of how it works out. And then literally nine out of 10 people, once they've looked for a business, they start seeing them on Google Maps, et cetera. Next steps, visit website, visit store or direct contact. So the graphic I have there on the side is the category of your business or specifically your store location on Google My Business or Google Business Profile, excuse me. The primary category you choose is probably one of the top ranking factors for people who are searching and looking for you. But here's the thing, they provide a list of categories. You can't just choose one. And if you choose jewelry repair service over jeweler, you will rank higher for one over the other, even if you do both. So kind of like choosing right away, being very specific on what the primary focus of your store is and how Google will showcase you, that's a key decision to make. They have additional categories. You can choose up to like four or five of those separate ones, but like 60% or more is like, boom, number one. Who are you and what you do? Quantity reviews. There is no formula in terms of if I have 50 reviews, I rank higher. If I have 100 reviews, I rank higher, et cetera. It's just literally more reviews, the better. Doesn't necessarily beat out proximity. 
There's one little catch. If you're a new business or you're just setting up your account, the first 10 reviews you get will give you a sizable bump in traffic, basically Google kind of validating that you exist. But after that, it's just literally a quantity game. So keep on asking for reviews, but they're not going to be the key of are you showing up over a local competitor, so to speak. Website URL attributes, primary categories, et cetera, all important things. If you have a Google, if you have a well-optimized Google business profile, that's 90% of the battle. The rest is just maintaining it and keeping it updated. Replies from business owners have no impact on rankings at all, nor does keywords in the review from the business owner or the response to. That has been tested and debunked, and I was heartbroken to find that out. It's still good to do that, leave reviews, leave comments, somebody has a bad experience, do what you can to help them, but it has no direct impact. Yeah, kind of makes sense, but you know, if there's a hack out there, somebody's probably found it and exploited it and they're trying to always plug the holes everywhere. So when people actually find your website and they come to you and they're looking to purchase, how the website looks and performs is a big factor. So you wanna always make certain that your website is optimized. Um, across our platform, we're seeing like 85 to 90% of all visits are coming from somebody's mobile phone. And strangely enough, purchases, 70 to 80% of purchases are from somebody's mobile phone. Nobody really sits at their desktop computer looking for jewelry, unless it's my parents, slash you're sitting in the store looking at your own website. All everything is coming through here nowadays. So whenever you're designing a page, whenever you're kind of um, sending traffic, keep a critical eye on what is the experience somebody will have on their phone. And I would even extend that to if you're designing an email, you're sending an SMS message, you're creating a Facebook ad, literally look at it on your phone how readable, what would the experience be? Is the call to action clear? Is the value proposition there? All of those things matter more than how does it look on this screen? When it comes to the mobile design too, one of the big things we've been pushing in recent years is kind of refreshing people's websites. A lot of our older designs were focused more on that desktop experience before mobile started really taking off and especially since COVID and things. We have seen people who've redesigned their mobile website have upwards of a 62% increase in their organic traffic within just months of it launching. A couple of years ago, Google switched how they rank websites from a desktop first model to a mobile first model, meaning literally the desktop view of your website does not matter to Google and their rankings. It's how does it look? How does it perform on mobile completely? That has led to significant changes in how our processes work, how we design things, what we're doing under the hood from a development standpoint, just to make certain that everything we are building and deploying works the best in somebody's mobile Google, Chrome, mobile Safari, et cetera. Mobile matters more than ever. Any questions? Yep. <laughs> Yep. Nothing happens. Like, I'm going to buy it again. Nothing happens. What would my next step be to try to get that? If Google will not reach out to you or remove it on their behalf, it's going to stay there. There's really not a next step. I'm sorry. I've, I've had that question asked before. Um, I've even had people like, you know, how do I get rid of this person who's just ranting and raving, calling me names, et cetera. You got to drown them out slash respond to them from a higher level than how they replied to you. Downside, if you were perfect 5.0, you're now 4.9.9. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man.
So when it comes to the Google crawler, a lot of their attention when they land on a mobile page is what is showing up on first view. They wanna make certain that first load is the best customer service experience possible. So you wanna include things like you know the product name, ideally the product price point, a short description and a call to action. The Google bot when it's crawling does not stop there. So people will start scrolling or the Google bot will start scrolling downward, see the content, rank for the keywords, et cetera, push it up in the rankings customers themselves, you're either basically kind of relying on capturing their attention that first 70, 140 characters, or you're going to start seeing that gradual drop off. So if 100 people are on, you know, 100% of people are on that first load, it's going to start going down to 90%, 80%, 70%, et cetera. That's how it works on basically every website page. It just comes down to how enticing is your copy, the product price, is it what they're actually looking for? Are they interested? customer behavior at that point. Google cares about the product name, product title, the pricing, things like that. If you have that up at the very top, Google and the customer both care for it. Um, be very careful optimizing things purely for Google if it comes at the detriment of a good customer experience. So one um, off the cuff example of that too. When it comes to ranking websites, especially on mobile, they have a lot of different things that they call page experience metrics. One of which is that if you have a pop-up that shows up on your phone, like if you wanna capture somebody's email or let them know you have an event coming up 10% off, et cetera. If that pop-up literally takes over your entire screen, Google would view that as obstructive and a bad customer experience and will ding you for it. So they recommend things like half a pop-up. So most of the page is still visible and people can read it, but if it literally takes over the whole thing, and as an example, I can show you later that I've seen from a couple different people that are using it, that's a bad experience. And Google has said, we will penalize you. I don't know what that penalty looks like because it's, who knows. cut them down a little bit, make them more relevant. Basically don't provide a bad experience slash put your business needs above somebody shopping. Questions about this? I wanna talk about measurement and budgeting. Now that we've kind of gone through the funnel, how do we actually focus on the effectiveness of a lot of different things we're doing? Like we talk a lot about impressions. Let's talk about like actual like sales clicks. How are things actually coming to you? Where should you be investing in things? So one of the most frustrating things from a digital marketing perspective is attribution. With all these different platforms and different options out there, whenever I hear somebody say, I saw you on Google, that just, I hate that because I don't know what that means. Um, similar when somebody is at the counter and they're in the edge or putting attribution and things like that, where did the customer, where did the lead come from? Well, it came from Google. Certainly. Was it YouTube? Was it search? Was it maps, et cetera? It's just kind of being lumped into Google as a company, but ultimately clearly it was the five-star reviews that made it the difference. The job of marketers is unfortunately changing and getting a little bit more difficult with the new introduction of Google Analytics 4. So the old Google Analytics, which was version three called Universal, that's been around for about 10 to 12 years. But as of June 30th of this year, it's dying, it's going away, the data will be gone. It's switching entirely over to GA4. It's their newer version they launched in 2020 and has been slowly, slowly getting ready for prime time. Couple big differences to it. Um, attribution is completely different than it used to be. So kind of like, how would somebody get the commission? How would somebody attribute like a marketing ad or a television commercial that led to a purchase? Completely changing under the hood in terms of how Google is gonna measure that. And ultimately key performance indicators can be a little unrealistic too. So whenever we try to do benchmarking, we always wanna make certain that we're doing sustainable growth, we're growing things over time, not trying to swing for the fences. What can we do to double website traffic or website sales month over month over month over month into infinity? Just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. 
key difference with GA4 versus the older Google Analytics Universal, GEA Universal used to collect e-commerce revenue with a number of different combinations. So it would be the item revenue, it would be the shipping, it would be the taxes. So they would basically lump everything together and say, you just made a $1,200 sale on your website. GA4 does not collect on the taxes and it does not collect on the shipping. It would literally be what is the revenue from the product itself or the per item price. So a $1,000 transaction would only be $1,000 in Google Analytics 4. What you're gonna see then shake out over the next couple of months, especially after the July 1st transition is your e-commerce sales might be down, but really it's just not collecting that additional information that was being collected before. Our websites still push that data. Google just doesn't care about it anymore. They wanna measure things differently. Attribution models when it comes to marketing are changing as well. So it used to be that if you saw an ad and the first time you clicked on that ad, that's where the attribution was. They saw that ad, they ended up purchasing, boom, the ad was a success. That cam campaign was a success. Google's getting rid of that in their infinite wisdom. They now want it to be last click slash data driven. Last click being if a customer saw you 10 different places, but finally clicked on an ad, that final ad is what matters above all, regardless of how many times they saw you or talked to you. Data driven is literally every step in the marketing funnel from a YouTube ad to a shopping campaign to eventually clicking a display ad or a search ad. Every single touch point gets a percentage of the attribution. And it's different per account, depending on what you're running. There's no model Google has rolled out. It's literally account specific. So I'm actually gonna to toss that question back to you guys. If somebody saw a Google ad and clicked on Google Maps, came into the store and bought a thousand dollar ring from you, where does the attribution go? Where does the commission go? Ultimately, yes, because the person at the counter would need to get that commission. That's what they have earned. Now, would a campaign have been effective if somebody said, I came into the store from Google and they don't specify, I saw a Google ad, I saw a YouTube ad, I saw a shopping ad. A little bit more challenging then, isn't it? <laughs> so, oh, they already are. <laughs> So Google actually had their own version of geofencing for a little while and they got rid of it. What? That they don't have. I don't think they have a hardware component to it. Okay. I'm sure there's somebody out there that they can integrate with that like ties all these things together. Like we've worked with a number of different people who do that, but it is ridiculously complicated. And even then too, okay, what brought you in? Was it the Google ad or was it the Google ad you saw? And then a day later, you pulled out your phone, looked on maps and said, I'm coming to David Douglas. Yep. Yep. So whenever we do reporting, we try to break it down into, you know, the channels, the campaigns. There's a lot of activity that's happening. It's leading toward end, these end results. Flip side of that could have been, here's our end results. What are the things that we have been doing each month consistently that led to it? I'm not a big fan of stop and go marketing. Like, hey, we have a campaign coming up. Let's run it for seven days. Oh, there goes our entire budget. We're never doing marketing again kind of thing. It's not effective. But if you look at you know, your total that you made at the end of the month and then said, oh, we had this running, this running, and this running all supporting it, it touched a million different people it led to these outcomes, not just the clicks, but also the sales. That's a much more effective way of attributing and measuring the different marketing dollars. A new feature coming out in GA4 that the data is going to be a little suspect for a while as people kind of refine things and tracking, et cetera, is they want to be able to track how many different channels people are touching for a sale and specifically how long does it actually take to purchase. Not everybody will pull out their phone and immediately say, I'm going to go buy a $500 ring or something. It might take three or four days, multiple touch points to do it. 
Google wants to be able to provide us that data of saying, hey, you know, this $255 purchase took three organic searches and literally took three days for somebody to transact. I don't quite know how they're pulling all this data together. And it's something I'm very interested in figuring out as they keep on building on GA4. But ultimately, this is the goal. We want to be able to measure effectiveness of every transaction that happens, especially online. Let's talk about uh, Google Analytics account ownership real quick. So GA4, the introduction July 1st, is a golden opportunity to kind of fix some of the sins of the past. Everybody in this room owns their own email account. They have their own banking account, et cetera. Just like, you know, at Punchmark, Bottom Line Marketing, et cetera, we have our own dedicated Google account that we've registered under our name. Underneath that organization, you can set up multiple accounts and set up multiple properties. What we do and what we prefer doing is whenever we bring on a new marketing client or we bring on a new website client, we want to make certain that that store owns all of their stuff, all their profiles, all their accounts. That often requires setting up your own Gmail account if you haven't set up one for the store. If we've set up a Google Analytics profile and property for you in the past, we can migrate that property with all that data underneath your Gmail account so you have complete ownership of things, but we can't give you the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. I can't give you my bank account, Ross's credit card, et cetera. You have to be able to log in and see your own data and then just have us as a joint host basically sharing permissions to look at the things together. So if there's anybody here who's like, hey, I really want to have complete ownership of my Google Analytics data, make certain it's all underneath your own name. Connect with me, connect with Hope tomorrow. We'll make certain that we can transfer it over to your account. So the property and the data is good and secure. You just now have actual ownership of it as opposed to us being the custodian of it. That was a very technical explanation for things. <laughs> Let's talk about budgeting. Obviously, budgets vary depending on needs, seasonality, how sales went last month, how sales went last year, slash what have you budgeted for the entire year. Um, a lot of stores tend to get their budget done sometime February, March. Other people, like by December, they're like raring to go. If I were to take basically $100 a day, just make numbers easy so I can get 100% and things like that, here is how, from a digital marketing and e-commerce perspective, I would break down the budget. And obviously, dials can be you know, scaled here and there. 10% of your budget should always go toward branded search. Bid on your own name. What shows up in Google tends to be the default. We are a store. We are located in Florida. We carry Rolex. Boom. But if you do a brand search campaign, basically bid on your name, when somebody searches for you, they will instead see we are also offering a special right now. We have a Valentine's Day thing going on, Mother's Day coming up. You have an opportunity to change and control the message and send them to a landing page other than the homepage. They already know your store. Direct them to where they're most effective to lead to a purchase. It's low-hanging fruit above all. Yeah. And to add on that, the results you see in search and the results you'll see from a search ad are different if you're on your computer versus on your phone. So somebody could be sneaky and say, I'm just only gonna bid on somebody's phone and be above your store's name. You gotta check both of them because they can be completely different experiences. You can. Which, which part? Um, a phone ad can be different than a desktop computer ad. So check both. Because somebody could say, I literally only want to run an ad on phones over your store's name, putting their phone number above yours. Brand search helps mitigate that. At some point, it becomes an arms race. If, they're willing, if you're willing to put $10, they'll put 12 But you can keep an eye on that kind of stuff. The next phase down, I would say if e-commerce is a main goal of yours versus more in-store traffic, spend a lot of the budget on Google Shopping and Facebook product carousels. 
get the products in front of as many people as possible to purchase. Subdivide them, promote them, push them, and then from there, start optimizing for time of day when people are searching, start optimizing for location. If it's 10 miles from your store versus I think I can pull somebody from the next county over, you got a lot of little levers you can pull and tweak to kind of like really maximize that. But ultimately, you want to get the products in front of them if e-commerce sales are more of your goal than just come to the store, buy the high ticket items. Next level down, start bidding on like services and things, basically non-brand stuff. So things like jewelry repair, jewelry appraisals, great way of generating phone calls, getting more people to come to you. And they tend to be a little bit cheaper than going for like a $15, $20 engagement ring click. If you can fill in your pipeline and start getting the bookings for the services, you have an opportunity to create lifetime value customers, push in that direction. And then finally, big picture, video and awareness. Get on YouTube, have a short video, whether it's literally mobile optimized, so it only runs on people's mobile phones on YouTube, or if you want to go desktop as well too. Start promoting that to the largest segment of customers nearby, getting your name out there so you become a household name and not just an option as people are driving by and ignoring you. Matthew's calling. Sorry. Yep. Um, and then I just threw this in here at the little bit too. Um, what I've seen from national surveys and things like that is that it's roughly five to 7% of a total month's budget goes back to marketing. Various per store, obviously. So ultimately, retail jewelry stores have a tremendous opportunity to keep on growing, both their in-store as well as their online sales. And as long as you're optimizing for every step in the buyer's journey, taking advantage of the different trends and changes and opportunities that are happening, you will see success, you will see growth. Just a matter of how aggressive do you wanna be and where do you wanna prioritize? Any questions? Anything? Yes. Ah. The SEO underneath Bing and Yahoo is fundamentally the same. Google has something called a Google Search Console where you can upload your sitemap, make certain that you know how all the technical aspects in Google are performing. Bing has their own equivalent called Bing Webmaster Tools. You want to register an account on that, verify it, upload your sitemap, and then observe how things change over the coming months. But the underlining, there, there's key differences. You know, the search results will be different, but the underlining like principles of SEO on those platforms are basically the same. From a Bing ad standpoint, um, it's typically about a third of the cost of Google ads, but it's a different audience. So if you treat Bing, treat it as you're reaching an older demographic and especially ones who don't know to change the default search engine in Windows to Google. <laughs> But it's not bad, you know? Like my dad uses Bing, but I haven't changed anything for him, so. Yeah. Any other questions? Any digital marketing topic? At some point, yes, that would be a Jason question. <laughs> However, he wants to distribute them. Yeah. 30 day delay, yeah. <laughs> Got to go through legal first. More questions? I saw you, you half raised a hand. Oh, there's nothing. Thank you all. And the next speaker is somebody who never wears a name badge and needs no introduction. <laughs> Mr. Lenny from the Edge. <laughs> Take your time, man. <laughs>